Hi everyone, welcome back to my shop. In the last video at the end, you probably remember me saying we're going to jump right into the tailwheel and finish that up. Well, I'm going to hold off for that on that a little bit, uh, just for a few minutes. What I want to go back to on the last video is the push rod. Uh, remember when I said this? I need to mention, because I'm picky, number one is the only reason I'm mentioning this, is that the push rods they give you are actually terrible. The diameter is not consistent the whole length of the rod. If you look down it, you can see it does this. So uh, they're not the best. If you can replace them, it might be a good thing to do that. But I don't have any rod that size, so I'm just going to go with what, I, what they give me. And another thing is they have a sharp bend. Well, it's fairly sharp inside the fuselage where this goes in. The reason it's there is so it clears the retract. And there's no getting around it, and it puts a little bit of... Um, can you hear that? Get the microphone. It's very tight right here. Well, that night, I was sitting in my chair, and I'm sitting there thinking about that push rod and the binding, and that, that just kind of irked me a little bit. And uh, so I thought it over, and I thought, well, if I was putting this plane together and the push rods were not straight and I had a bind, would I leave it like that? And I thought to myself, no. So I just couldn't leave it alone. The next day, I came down and I got out my Dremel tool and I have a handheld with a screw on flex cable. And I've used this to go inside and either drill holes. In this case, I have a, a cutting bit on here, it has a drill tip on it so you can punch through and then open up a hole. And what I did is went in and uh, oblonged the holes where the push rod outer casing went through each former and I hollowed out those formers so the push rod could relax and make a straight line so when I picked up the plane and set the push rod in there and let it go it just fell straight into the fuselage on, on both elevators uh, push rods so that's what I did and then once I did that I had to back them up with a little bit of plywood or basswood I use basswood you can use plywood or balsa wood just to re, uh, I guess, uh, re-strengthen those cutout formers. Because some of them, you, you open them up and it just cuts right straight through into the open air where they've cut lightning holes in that were, ex no, I think they were excessive on their lightning holes. But you just had to make a plate and push it up against there and sure up those push rods again. So that's what I did. And... Uh, if you have a heavy bind in your P40 and it takes a little bit of push to get it through, there really shouldn't be any kind of a resistance there. It should just push right through. You could actually do one of these numbers with your fingers and give it a little toss. It should shoot right inside. If it doesn't, then you have a bind. Uh, for instance, let me break out the whiteboard. Another crude drawing on my whiteboard. The straight line is just to give you a contrast of the bend in the outer casing of the push rod. The dotted line is a straight line from end point to end point and the double line is the outline of the casing of the push rod, the outer casing of the push rod. And inside the plane, as soon as the push rod enters the plane, there's a former that holds it and I didn't touch that one. Then there's a double former that uh, it's where the tail wheel mounts. And then there's a third former, and that's the one I put the, the subformer on. And that one I oblong the hole. And the double former I oblong the hole. And when I relieve that, the push rod casing went into a straight line. And I installed my metal push rod in the inside and set the plane on its nose, and the push rod just fell right into the airplane. So I know there's no bind there anymore. And I did that on both sides. And to fix the holes that I oblonged, I dabbed epoxy around them to fill the holes with some micro balloon, five minute epoxy micro balloon, just filled the holes to hold the casings in place on all the formers. Uh, on the double former, 
I had to install a piece of basswood as a holder basically and CA glued that to the original former and I think that happened on both sides and the reason for that is they cut so much of the former away that there wasn't much room to oblong the hole so uh, let's see what else can I tell you oh and I checked the tail wheel fit and by moving the push rod over a little bit did not affect the tail wheel retract at all there's no uh, interference there you're looking at the hardware we'll be using to mount the tail wheel retract along with the steering for the tail wheel and the gear door hatch so over here I got them kind of boxed off is a 4 by 20 millimeter cap screw with a 4 millimeter flat washer and a 4 millimeter lock washer and that holds the landing or the tail wheel retract into place down here we have 1100 millimeter cable there's two of those and three by 30 millimeter connectors which are these two the ball link assembly and you've seen those before along with the 3 by 12 millimeter screw flat washer and lock nut and let's see and I kind of broke that one package up into different things this is for the gear door hatch assembly you have the four 3 by 10 millimeter button screws and two 3 by 8 millimeter screws and you have two springs that close open and close the the gear doors and these two little wood screws which are not shown here uh, let's see let me flip some pages here to find where those are they are three by ten millimeter wood screws that hold the hatch down in the back so now you're familiar with the parts we're going to be using uh, let me bring in the landing gear retract okay now you've seen all the parts and uh, let me rearrange the camera again and we'll get started installing this thing the first thing I have to do to get this tail wheel assembly or retract in is to put these cables in there you go this is the 1100 millimeter cable and it's going to go through here on the outside hole that's what they say but first let me get uh, this thing right here they call the lock nut it's that little aluminum tube slide it in on the cable kind of slide that down a little bit I'm at a funny angle so I can't see what I'm doing not very well at least okay and you're gonna have to have a little overhang that's probably more than I need but that's okay and my little lock nut thing is trying to slide away from me this is how I do it and they show something similar in the instruction manual but I slide the little crimping lock nut thing that they call it on onto the cable and then slide the end back through it so you have a loop and slide it up fairly tight because the last thing you want to do is have this thing loop up here and get caught so the tighter you can make it the better and that's about it now this gets looped back around and comes back through the other side that helps lock it in place Let's see if I can do this and it's not cooperating okay now it's going through and you cinch that up tight as tight as you can at least 
and my hemostats are not that good. These small ones are a little bent. So what I do is I give it a little bend in it. And try to cinch all this stuff up tight. Kind of move things around on us here. And that is about as far as that cable is going to bend, it looks like. It gets quite stiff when you get into a little tiny spot like that. Then what I use as a pair of side gutters, let me see if I can get in the frame. These are old, not very sharp. And you want to crimp this down. I like doing it three places. Both ends in the middle. So it looks something like that. And since side cutters work on angles, when you crimp, it's not going to be tight all the way across. It's going to be the tightest crimp is going to be on the outside edge. So I go in on the other side and I crimp the other side down as well. That'll ensure that the cable won't pull through. And that's really all you do. My loop is a little big, so what I like doing is take my pair of pliers here, needle nose pliers, and just put a flat bend in the ends to keep it from sticking up too far. And that is it right there. And uh, another thing I do is I'll smash it down against the horn like that. So that's really all there is to it. And I already have the other side done so you can see both sides working. And now we're at the point where it has to go into the airplane. So let me zoom out and we'll continue on. I already have the wires started into the tubes where they go and you're probably noticing this and this is just to grab the wire coming out of the front of the tailwheel retract. So I'm going to feed these through. Give me a second and when I get them all the way in there I'll be right back. Cables are tucked in there as far as I can go at the moment and I need to get this wire situated so I can grab it with my little piece of music wire. All I have is a little hook on the end. I'm just going to stick it in between the wires. There's a little slice in there if I can get it to go. Like that. And I'm going to pull it through the center of the plane if I can find my wire now. And get that started. Okay, it's not all the way through, but far enough that I can get things going. All right, and all this has to be done a little at a time, getting the wires to push through and the cables to go. So when I get this in exactly the spot that I want, I'll be back and uh, show you the rest. I have the cables pushed in all the way and the wired pull pulled all the way through and it's time to set this thing into the cradle. It has a little cradle in the very top of the fuselage that this slides down into and then the cap screws hold it here and to secure it we have the 4 by 20 millimeters cap screw, 4 millimeter lock washer and 4 millimeter flat washer. And they just go down through the top like so and I'm going to just gently screw that one down a little ways. Get the other one in there. Get my handy dandy little tool here. Zip them down into place. These are kind of long-winded screws so it takes a little while to get them down there. You 
If you have a small electric screwdriver with a clutch system on it, that'd be a perfect tool for this. Crank them down good and tight. Don't want it to come loose in flight. I may take those screws out and put some lock, uh, some Loctite on them so I don't have to worry about them backing out or anything like that. Now that the retrack is installed, let's move on to the gear doors and hatch. Let's get started on this gear door. This gear door that's already on the hatch, I have completed. It's already been glued into place. The hinges is, are nothing more than the same as the rudder hinges, except that the bottom part of the hinges are pre-cut and the instructions they show them show that you have to cut these yourself but they come pre-cut. Uh, I already glued them into here and I did it the same way as the rudder like I said. The first thing is to attach this little 90 degree bracket which I forgot to mention earlier when I showed the parts and that goes right here like that and it you use this three by eight millimeter screw with the three millimeter lock nut to hold that on. So we'll attach that real quick. Okay, and then the 3 by 10 millimeter screw with the nut goes on from the underside, but it goes through the spring first. Let's see if I can get it to go through the spring. And that gets moved all the way down to the head of the screw. And it comes up through the bottom with a nut on top. So let me get out my tool. I'm going to tighten this down and I'll be right back. There it is. It's it's nice and tight and to uh, get the proper alignment they show that the 90 degree uh, bracket here has to be in line basically with this edge of the uh, hatch cover and another thing to note is that the hinges are four millimeters down from the center of the hinge to the edge of the hatch. And if you look real close, my hatch came damaged with a hairline crack right here. And it's, it's a defect that runs all the way up to here. I don't know if you can see it or not. I'm going to rotate a little bit. But it's there. Kind of bums me out a little bit, but that's the way it is. So, next up, install the spring. And when you tighten this down, the spring faces forward, like on here. That's the way they want it, so that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to attach the nut. And this does get tightened all the way down. So give me a second. I'm having a hard time here. <laughs> and I'll be right back when this uh, screw and nut are tightened down. Both the screws are tightened down, spring is attached, and now it needs to be set into here. And you'll see that there's two small holes already for the hinges. And they don't go in that easy. These are fairly tight. But I just want to get it in there before I glue it and show you what it looks like. Okay. These hatches don't fit the best either. They're, you know, generically cut out. And I got a problem here that the hatch is warped, which when it gets screwed down in the back, I don't think it's going to matter because it'll pull it back into place. And that's the best fit I could get right there. Not the best in the world, but who's going to look at the bottom of your airplane, right? But not the prettiest. So what I'm going to do is mix up some 5-minute epoxy, put some 5-minute epoxy inside the holes and a little bit on the hinge, slide it in there, close the doors, and wait for them to dry. 
and after they're dry I'll be right back to finish off the hatch all I need to do is put uh, these little three millimeter by ten millimeter wood screws in and they go right here you can probably see one right there and there's one on the other side just have to screw those down and that will basically take care of most of the hatch hardware and if I can get this to go into the hole there we go get it started it's going to try to put threads into the, the hatch itself and I need to keep this aligned so it goes in correctly okay it has to be right there I'll get my hands out of the way in a second there we go that's one screw down I'm gonna do the other one off camera and when I come back we'll uh, lower the tail wheel and attach these springs to the assembly here so the gear doors will work and then we'll see how everything functions Now, I have to attach the springs to these ears right here, and according to the book, they have to be turned a little bit, so let me try to turn these things. They have to be turned in this direction like that. Approximately on that angle. And I have to install the 3 by 10 millimeter screw into the spring without slipping and shooting my little three millimeter screw across the room that wouldn't be good I've done it before I know that <laughs> and here's that this is awkward because I'm on the opposite side of the plane and I can't see what's going on looks like enough there to put the little nut on there maybe not or just I'm that uncoordinated I think it's the latter okay there it is and I'm gonna do the same to the other side I'm gonna screw them down tight and get the springs all arranged and we'll be able to see this whole thing operate in a second I played with the retract a little bit and the gear door sequencing is rather odd it's kind of ugly looking but what I found is the screw that goes through the spring that mounts it to the retract on both sides these two screws need to be loose so the spring can rotate and the screw on the L bracket where the spring attaches to the bracket needs to be loose also so the spring can turn so when I do a cycle on this retract pay attention to the way the springs operate on the gear doors you'll see them turn a little bit that's a really ugly looking sequence but that's the way they work that's it to make them look even better I have that other control box with the gear door sequence on it and two servos would probably make that work a lot better but 
it's only a sport model and it's for fun and uh, doing it by the book and these things kind of flop around so your airspeed will be low enough when you drop this gear that it's not gonna rip off or anything from flutter I suppose we need to flip the airplane over and attach the cables for the steerable tailwheel onto the servo we're looking down into the servo compartment and that's kind of obvious isn't it so we have the two elevator servos one's already hooked up the other one is in a neutral position on the elevator I have a metal ruler taped to the horizontal stabilizer and elevator and this is where it wants to line up and you can see the rod is too long so I have to I'm going to have to cut it off just before this black line right here to get it the right length not a big deal I'll just get the Dremel tool and a cutting wheel and take care of that real fast I've already pre-drilled the arm for the 12 millimeter screw and you can see that the, the starboard side is already done now the rudder servo you can see that the, the rod is also a bit too long and it also wants to go to the underside of the arm it won't go high enough to be on top so I'm not really sure how I'm going to deal with that I might have it underneath and for the wires going to the steerable tail wheel on the retract they say to use the same ball link and I was going to use these here let me put them in the frame and this is the same as the gray it's just a black one but if I use that I'm going to limit myself to one hole on the servo arm so I decided that I would make a change and make up my own and this is what I came up with this is a piece of brass tubing soldered on to a 440 screw it was a long one I cut the head off screwed on a Dubro clevis that has a locking clip that goes on here and to keep it from moving I have a 440 nut and that was pretty simple to make and that will actually go on either one of these two holes so I'll have a little bit of adjustment on how much throw I want with this ball link attached so there's really not much I can show you on this um, I'm gonna have my hands in a way cutting the rods off and then you've already seen how to connect the wire to uh, basically this the wire is going to go through with a little crimping lock that goes on there and that'll be all set up here the next time I come back so give me a minute I'll get this set up and then we'll continue on When attaching your pull-pull cable to your ball link assembly on your servo, make sure that the surface that it's connected to is tight and locked in a neutral position. Take your cable and install your crimp tube, aluminum crimp tube. Then put the cable through the eyelet of the ball link assembly, like that. Loop it back through your aluminum tube slide the crimp tube as close to the ball link assembly as you can it'll stay there when you let go then loop the tag end of your pull pull cable back through the aluminum tube so you have a loop like that I like using a pair of pliers for this part grab your tag end and push your aluminum tube is keep it as close to the ball link as you can and once it gets to a point where it's real tight like that it starts to pull hard 
and your tube is as close to the ball link as you can. Grab onto it, give it a pull. My servo is starting to come loose. Give it a pull, and it will make a small loop against the aluminum tube. Pull it tight, and keep it tight while you're crimping it down with your side cutters. You can go over top of the loop because the loop won't cut because of the thickness of the aluminum tube and crimp it down. Then remove the excess of the tag end with your side cutters. And there you have it. You still have a nice tight connection, a nice small loop against the ball link assembly, and it's not going to come apart. The servos are all installed, the rods are all adjusted, the cables adjusted, and there's not much more to do on the rear section of the airplane from here back. Everything is, is done. So let me show you how this is going to work. Oh, and you probably noticed that the two arms on the elevator are not straight across from each other. That's because I'm using a servo reverser. I'm going cheap on this model, so I only have a seven channel receiver in here. So a reverser was necessary. If I had an eight channel, of course, I'd put it on, another, on one of the elevators on another channel. But that's just the way it is. They're analog servos. And being off like that won't hurt the motion any because the movement on the elevators is quite, quite small. So uh, there's, there's going to be really no uh, problems with that. So, show you the rudder movement. Okay, elevator. And that is about it. So, for now on, we're going to be looking at the front half of the plane. S probably, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you that when I installed the rudder cable, I found I didn't have enough throw. So I went to the tail wheel on the horn, the control horn. I cut the cables off and I put them to the inside hole to give me more throw on my tail wheel. Uh, if you like a lot of throw on your tail wheel, that's something you might want to consider. If you're happy with just a little bit, that's fine too. But for many, many years since I can remember, on every tail dragger I've ever had, I always had a lot of rudder throw and a lot of tail wheel movement, uh, just personal preference. So I just wanted to let you know that I did make a change back there. And uh, if you like a lot of tail wheel control, you might want to consider doing the same. All right, next, we're gonna be moving to the firewall. Let's see, where is this at? I, I flipped a couple pages by accident, a couple too many. And what they are talking about doing, okay, well, I seem to be missing something here. Um, they're talking about something I did right off the bat when I got the airplane out, and that was to uh, pre-drill the holes for my DLE 35 with this plate and I uh, explained that earlier and that's done and next they're talking about using this little packet here for these little uh, mounts these there's uh, six of them I believe yeah and they go around the firewall there's little notches in the firewall to fit these tabs and you slide them in there with some CA glue and in here there are two holes for two wood screws to hold this in place and all they do is hold the cowling on okay not not a big deal uh, I'll do one on camera and I'll do the other ones off camera and uh, knock that off real fast and then after that we go into mounting the engine see that right there you probably can't probably too small but that's what we're going to be doing so let me change things around and we'll get set up i'll put the little get the tabs going here get the let's see 
probably end up having to do this fiberglass plate too. This has to be drilled and stuck on the firewall too. So that's going to have to be done before we put the motor on. So uh, give me a second. I'll be right back. Well, I tried to record the installation of the, the cowling mount, but it was just so crowded that it didn't work out well. So basically there's two tabs here slid it into the holes with some CA glue on the bottom of the mount. Put the two screws in and there's two pre-punched holes there for the screws and it makes it very easy to start the screws and to get them into place. That's really all there is to it. I already put the other five in and like I said it was just too small of an area to show you the attaching of the cowling mounts. So let's move on to the firewall. On the firewall you can see I put the fiberglass piece on. That's with a 15 minute epoxy and I painted it just to just for uniformity. And to drill the holes through there I used the same plate which is the DLE 35 plate and pre-drilled the holes. And you can see there's extra hole right here because the throttle hole is in the correct place but the choke hole for the cable or for the push rod is in the wrong place it needed to be down here so I had to drill this hole I'm going to plug this up with some five minute epoxy later but uh, I just wanted to make sure that you know that when you drill this you're going to have to uh, probably mount your engine and then line up your choke cable if you're going to use a choke cable and drill the hole that way you know just put a mark on there and drill it that's basically all I did now it's time I do imagine to uh, mount the engine and we'll go from there I have the motor temporarily mounted and the reason I did that is because it calls for a 165 millimeter spacing between the firewall and the engine hub so I put everything together to see and uh, they called for aluminum spacers and there are no aluminum spacers and they turn out to be plastic. So that was kind of a hold up and I wanted to make sure everything was going to fit properly. But I'll show you what I had to do. But first the parts we're going to get rid of are all this hardware here. Plastic uh, standoffs and small blind nuts, small screws. I believe this is for electric. and. Uh, I got the parts out of this bag that I needed for this assembly, so I won't be needing that. These are the electric motor mount templates, and uh, since we're going gas, we won't be needing those. But we will be needing these right here, and I'm going to look at the book here so I can tell you what they are. This is a 5 by 100 millimeter cap screw, which is the mount bolt. And we have five millimeter lock washers. I'm gonna slide these on as we go. Five millimeter flat washer. And we have 12 by 60, 60 millimeter aluminum tube. And this would be the spacing for where it goes through the engine mount here. And after that, it doesn't call for this, but I needed it because I was short if I didn't use this. It came out to like 164 and three quarter or almost a half, down to a half. But to get to the 165 mark, I needed this washer and it put me over by a smidge, maybe a, a half a millimeter. And then you have this plastic, which is a Let's see what they call it. A 16 by 5 millimeter aluminum, but it's not aluminum, it's plastic. And that's what worried me because they didn't have, they didn't call for a flat washer in between this aluminum tube and this plastic. And since there's a size difference, the pressure would be around the center and this will crack. So I figured with this washer in there, not just to give me the space I needed, or the extra length I needed, it would help distribute the weight or the pressure of this mounting across the whole surface of the plastic. And uh, I won't have to worry about it cracking so much, but I am afraid this is gonna break. 
So, with that said, I have my metric ruler and I measured out and it comes to 165 and a half millimeters. So that's that's pretty good. That's that's in the ballpark. And the next thing we have to do is set up the throttle linkage and the choke. And I already done basically that. And the throttle linkage is just going to be this clevis on a regular push rod. They have the push rod and the clevis in the kit. And I decided to deviate from that and I went to a soldered on. Uh, I believe this is an old SIG solder on uh, clevis and a standard rod which would be I'm not really sure maybe a 16th inch and that slides in here I'll spin this around so you can see the setup and then it goes inside to the servo which I've already mounted and I used a what did I use this time this is a JR servo it's an NES 4131 and it was the only spare 6 volt uh, servo I had left so I, I slid it in there so let me spin this around I'm going to show you the throttle hookup and the choke hookup and uh, try to get through this little engine segment I have three of the four motor mounts in place and I left the fourth one off because if I put it on there you wouldn't be able to see the throttle and the choke there's the choke the throttle and on my DLE I popped the spring off the return spring so it moves just like a regular RC carburetor so there's no uh, spring action okay for the choke I made this up I don't know how much of this you can see it's a clevis soldered on with the brass tube onto a piece of music wire and it's a 256 with a 256 nut holding uh, I believe this is a Sullivan clevis that takes a, a clip and on the other end is an old ball link that I had laying around and I have a ball link on here so I can just easily utilize everything and it slides through the firewall and it just snaps onto this ball like that and it moves like so now for the throttle is just a soldered on quick link I'm not sure the brand there's nothing stamped on there but it's soldered on to a 16th inch rod and that just goes through the firewall also to the servo and I'll have to connect it to the servo later but I'm going to attach it to let's see which way does this want to go make it so it's easier on me slide it open and I'll try to get it into place this is a very wide throttle arm okay how come it's not gonna go here I'm on the wrong side again I can't tell what I'm doing let's go down there it is snapped into place okay now you see how that's hooked up and now I'm going to change the camera angle again so you can see the inside and how I hook up a choke and the throttle looking down into the fuselage you can see the throttle linkage coming out to a quick keeper on my JR servo and this comes in the kit and it's a double nut system on the bottom down here is the choke linkage and you can see the brass tube and the 256 threaded rod nut and the Sullivan keeper with a quick uh, snap keeper on it I guess they call it this is a very old Goldberg bell crank that's been in at least 10 airplanes that I can think of over the last 30 years plus uh, it sits on a platform made out of basswood that goes all the way down to here and is braced up with half inch triangular stock and on the bell crank over here is a quick keeper with a 16th inch rod going to the outside and it connects to 
what used to be a brass nut that I ground round into a disc so I can operate my push-pull choke system. All the way out is choke, all the way in it's off. A lot of guys don't like to use bell cranks so what I want to do is take a few minutes and take the mystery out of bell cranks because I've seen people put these in wrong and they complain that they get stuck and they got to loosen them up and they adjust the nuts on them all the time to try to make them work right. But I'll show you how to install these correctly and uh, probably most of you already know how to do it but a few I'm sure haven't used bell cranks. So uh, I'm going to take the mystery out of those so you can set these up in your plane if you want to put a choke system in like this. Before we get started, let me tell you the manufacturer of bell cranks that I know of. And the only company that I know that makes them right now is Dubro. So wherever Dubro product products are sold, I'm sure you'll be able to pick some up. And what you get in the package, they're sold in the, by pairs. So in the package you get two bell cranks, two bushings, and the bushings are made of brass, two 440 screws, two lock washers, two flat washers, and two 440 nuts. I've never used them myself, but they look very heavy duty. They're lower profile. I think they'll work very well. Let's get on with uh, putting this thing together. Now this bell crank is very old. It's been in at least, I would say, 10 airplanes over the last 30 years, just like the other one inside on my choke. Actually, they worked the Aerolons on an old Goldberg Skylane many many years ago. Uh, start off you have your platform that your bell crank is going to sit on. In this case it's a piece of ass wood. It could be light ply or plywood. And to start you take your screw and a flat washer like that. Okay then it goes through your base plate whatever that happens to be on your model from there you add one more flat washer come on get on there and then a nut Okay, slide that down real quick. All right. And then you tighten down the nut. In this case, I'm not going to make it very tight. If it was for real, I would actually crank this down quite tight with a screwdriver and a pair of pliers. Okay, the reason I set it up this way is that when the screw goes through the wood and has this big head on there, which would be the washer, it gives it a nice stable mount on the on the back side. And then with the flat washer and the nut over here, it's going to have less chance of squashing the wood and uh, countersinking too deep. And on top of all of that, it makes this a very, very solid and rigid Posts to put your bell crank on. It's not going to move. It's not going to wiggle. If you're really worried about it, you can hit it with a little bit of quick set CA and lock it down in there permanently. Okay, next is your bushing. Goes inside of the bell crank. Then your bell crank. Okay. Then the flat washer on top of all that then your little lock nut or lock washer then the last nut okay once that's all put together you tighten that down and there you have it it's nice and loose and it's not going to bind up on you and it's never going to come apart and the reason for that is your lock washer right here and you crank that down good and tight 
and it shouldn't matter how tight you make that un unless you kind of squash the bushing on the inside of the of the bell crank you don't want to do that and it's not going to go anywhere a lot of times I'll put a little dot of CA glue right here just to be extra sure but that's really all there is to it now that I have all the controls in throttle the choke elevator rudder tail wheel all that's done that's basically the have to's um, from here they say to go onto the tank but I like doing things a little different what I like doing is to start figuring out my center of gravity and the placement of my batteries and then move on and start installing everything piece by piece because I'll know where they go and I've already done that um, the opti kill switch is already in my light is up here dead man switch on this side uh, already have the CDI mounted on the top of the of the cowl or the firewall area and the book shows the CDI mounted on the bottom I did that on my first P40 and found that it got too hot and it burned up a $79 uh, CDI unit so I don't put it down there anymore I keep it away from the heat so I mounted it on top uh, that's about it for there I'm gonna bring the camera over and take a overhead shot of where my battery placements are and uh, talk a little bit about that starting in front of the servo tray we have the electric retract controller and it's sitting on a piece of light ply and a piece of quarter inch balsa underneath that glued down to the plate right here and the reason for the extra wood is to gain some height so I can see where to plug in my retracts that's all that's for and of course the receivers over here some of the servo wires are, are already pre-ran um, elevator aileron and flap connections are kind of dangling there over here we have the receiver switch and up here is the external engine kill switch and right here is the opti, opti switch that's hooked to the receiver so I can shut the engine off with the transmitter the wires are run through the lightning holes and velcro to the side right here just to keep them out of the way fuel tank will sit right here there's nothing going to be in the way of that when everything is strung out properly right here is a 7.4 volt battery that runs the retract it comes down to the side here this piece of balsa wood is there just to hold this piece of velcro and to keep the wire from touching the the choke rod and the throttle cable up top is the CDI for the 35 cc DLE I got up front it has a hole in the top for the wiring to go down inside the hall sensor plugs in here I haven't done that yet and the 7.4 battery is easy to come out I made a cradle on the inside I'll show you the cradle in a few minutes but this is how it comes out take that velcro off there velcro off the side loosen this up and it should just pull right out if I can get a grip on it there we go and that just pulls out now down here is my receiver pack and I had to make a box for it I didn't want it flopping around and that's held in with a piece of velcro and to get the ba battery out I don't know if you can see over my finger but it pulls out in a tray like that and that keeps it in one place okay let me try to get that back in there Just like that I'll hook the velcro up later now underneath here there are some things to show you so uh, I'm gonna change camera angle and bring you in a little closer and show you what I got right here you can see the cradle for the 7.4 battery it has foam lining the inside of the cradle to keep the battery nice and uh, tight down here is the receiver battery box and that's made out of plywood like uh, 16th inch ply 
and along with the ignition battery box that's made out of 16th ply the ignition battery slides up inside keeps from sliding around with the velcro holding it in place and the battery is wrapped with foam to keep a tight fit inside the box that's just about it for the inside so I'm going to change the camera angle and uh, I'll be right back I briefly touched on the LED light that I had mounted towards the top of the fuselage for the opti switch and this is why I have it mounted where I do and it is mounted on a piece of balsa so it's uh, easy to remove if I have to but this is why it is where it is I can see it very very well inside the cockpit it's hidden from view when uh, the lights not on it just makes for a little cleaner installation of the LED this is as far as I'm going to go on this video uh, on part five we're going to pick up with the fuel tank fuel line the fuel uh, filler then we're going to move to the cowling the hardware for the cowling just six screws the exhaust that go on the sides of the cowl going to drill the spinner for the engine along with the prop and if I have time we'll get into putting on the decals and that might just wrap up uh, the segment on this P40 I hope so if you need to uh, ask me a question just put it in the comments on on the video uh, or you can shoot me an email right up here uh, I'll answer your emails so I guess until next time have a good one